All right. So the plan for today is to talk about sections 23 and 24. Sections 22 that we talked about last time and 23 deal with area. And section 24 deals with dissection, which is highly related to area. So we're really not going to focus tons and tons on area. Why? Because I'm assuming that you guys um, had have dealt with area at least some point in your past lives. Uh, or previously to now. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the very formal setup for building to an area function, some of the background that you need. And what we're going to find is it's probably what you always expected an area function to do. Okay. Oh, I just saw a new question come in. Just a second. Um, yeah, you could. Uh, so the question was, uh, would uploading scratch work for test give you extra points? Maybe. In terms of the scratch work that I've seen so far with people, one, not very many people did it, but of those people who did it, um, I honestly, they were able to convey all of that information in the actual online version of the test as well. But yes, that would be a way where you could potentially get more points if you were able to write something out that you couldn't figure out how to put into the online form. But so far, I haven't found that it's actually helped anybody yet. All right, so back to area function stuff. So first background thing is something called an ordered abelian group, and that's actually highly, highly technical. Here's the part that you need to know about it. You start off and you have some abelian group, and this was something that we talked about in one of the previous videos. So it's one of the ones where we worked together live. It was one of the recorded videos, and it talked about an abelian group. This is a set of objects for us, typically numbers. It has one operation on it, Typically, when you talk about groups, you refer to that operation as addition, so that's what I'll do. So the first thing is addition has to be commutative and associative, so that means you can add things together in any way that you want to. You have to have a zero element. Now, if you're actually dealing with things like what we're going to be doing, which is integers and fractions and real numbers, your zero element is literally the integer zero. If you're dealing with other objects, maybe it's something like the zero vector if your objects are vectors. Um, and then you also have negatives. So negatives are, well, if you're dealing with integers, the negative two is literally negative two. But if you're in other and weird uh, um, groups, your negatives can actually be a little bit different. We're not going to be dealing with any of those weird um, groups. So for us, if somebody says negative, hey, we're going to be dealing with real numbers, fractions, integers, they would literally be put the little negative symbol out front, and bam, you're done. So if you need to be an ordered abelian group, so the ordered part here is the new thing, what happens is there's some subset, so some of your elements in your group are called positive. Now, if we're talking about things that are dealing with, like, real numbers, fractions, integers, these are literally going to be your positive numbers, okay? That says, hey, if you take any two positives or any two guys you call positive, their sum still has to be positive. No big surprise there. And if you pick anybody in the group, then you have exactly one of three conditions. It's positive, it's zero, or it's negative. Notice, if you're dealing with numbers, this doesn't feel like a big surprise. And that's actually one of the reasons it's put in here, because the higher up in math you get, the more weird number systems can be thrown your way. So if you need sort of what prior to high, prior to college you would always think is sort of normal and ordinary things happening, this is where you have to start defining them. Okay? So this basically says we need positive numbers. Okay? Now, relation, specifically in inequality, we're going to define it on an ordered abelian group. And it says, hey, if you've got, you want to define object A is greater than object B or number A is bigger than number B, this says, if you take the difference of A and B, it better be positive. Don't overthink this. Behind the scenes, what happens is you've simply subtracted B from both sides, and you've got that, hey, A minus B needs to be positive. Well, that's it. Notice nothing earth-shattering here. In other words, this here is just telling you your numbers need to work like you always thought they should have. Now we are ready to go ahead and jump into our area function. Technically, this area function is what's known as a measure function. Unless you're going up into some higher level um, math course, 
typically they start doing this soonest, soonest, excuse me, uh, in a statistics area, but it's not specific to that. Uh, you talk about measure functions, but let's face it, if you never see a measure function again, nobody cares. Here's all you need to know. So we're going to talk about an area function. We're going to start off in some sort of Hilbert plane. So the assumption here is all this stuff, baseline, you have a Hilbert plane. Your function alpha is going to be our area function. It's defined on the set script P. In other words, its domain is the set P, that's that scripty P, where P is a set of all the figures in your Hilbert plane. So all of your triangles, squares, trapezoids, all of those rectilineal figures. And values, this is your output. So this would be your, your range here. So with values in the order to billion group. That's just your outputs, your numbers. Okay. So here are your properties, and there's three of them. The first one is, if you have a triangle and you plug the triangle into your area function, you better get back a positive number. In other words, the area and the area of a triangle is positive. Oh, uh, you said P and Q, P and Q. Down here on point three. If it's point three, we'll get to it in just a second. Uh, the second condition that you've got is if you've got two congruent triangles, then their areas have to be the same. So if you've got two figures that are congruent, same area, except this is specific to triangles. And then the third condition that you have to have is suppose you have two figures and we're going to call one of them P and we're going to call one of them Q. So these now don't have to be triangles. They're just any two figures. So let's do an example here and I'm going to be super duper lazy. Maybe the first figure is a quadrilateral. I was shooting for a rectangle. And maybe the second figure is a triangle. So Q is a triangle. Okay. And the only condition you need is that these guys don't overlap. So their intersection, in other words, is the empty set. Or, at most, a single side. Then the area of the union of these two figures, and remember we talked about union of figures before, where you put them both together. Except here, the union would simply be the disjoint quadrilateral and triangle. Then the area of the union is simply the area of the two pieces, and you add it together. Now, what happens in the other situation where they're not disjoint pieces? Did not mean for that to be Q. Not disjoint pieces, but they actually are two different figures here, a square and a triangle, but they share a side. Turns out this is also called non-overlapping. Sharing a side is fine. And here your union is this pentagon shape here, the sort of sideways house, if you will. Well, the area of the union would be the area of this sort of sideways house, and that's simply the area of the two individual pieces added together. Notice this guy right here, totally a technique that we've used way back to whenever you were first calculating areas probably years ago. And that's it in terms of your area function. So notice what's going on here when we're talking about this little alpha parentheses P that's literally telling you area of figure, whatever the figure is inside the parentheses. Now, that's the definition of your area function. Here are some results. Don't overthink them. These results, for the most part, are relatively straightforward. So again, let's assume that alpha is our area function. We'll use that symbol for the rest of the course and previously when we were in classical geometry to mean area. We're going to go ahead and assume we're in a Hilbert plane. So here there are four things that can happen. The first one is suppose P is some figure. Maybe you think triangle. Maybe it's a rectangle. Okay? And the interior of this guy is not empty. So maybe it is something kind of like a triangle. So here's P. There's at least one point inside the interior. Then it turns out if you've got at least one point in the interior, the area of that figure P is going to be positive. Now, what do we know about areas? Areas, when we've talked about them before and also when we look into our definition up here, one of the things we see is that area is never negative. It's always some positive value. It can actually equal zero. So here's when it can equal zero. Suppose you have this guy to be your little figure. In this particular case, if you take the area of just that one single line segment, it would be zero. Uh, 
So why would the area here be zero? Because it's not a two-dimensional figure, it's a one-dimensional figure. There is no inside. So this condition right here of saying that you actually have an interior is really critical. That's actually the check to say you actually have positive area. Because otherwise, you basically don't have a way to define what area is. Or if you want to think about this, a one-dimensional rectangle, the width is whatever that width is, but the height is zero. So zero times whatever that width is, is zero. Now, technically, we don't have the formula yet for area of a rectangle, but I'm pretending that you guys have all done that before. Okay. That's the first thing that you get. Second result that you get is linking back to equidecomposable that we talked about last time. So suppose you have two figures, P and lazy P prime, lazy because we didn't come up with a new letter. If those two guys are equidecomposable, and remember, equidecomposable means you take one of the figures, maybe P, you cut it up into a bunch of pieces that are all triangles, you take those triangles, you spin them, you rearrange them, you move them around, and you're able to form this second figure. If the two figures are equidecomposable, turns out they're always going to have exactly the same area. Why? Because you can use this property right up here in the definition of the area function, it says, hey, I can t add up all the individual areas of all those triangles and build up to the entire area. Technically, we don't have that result yet, but that's totally where we're going. Um, I'm going to skip out on equal content. Ah, I should say a comment here. We've been talking about equal content through the entire semester, more or less, and every time we've hit equal content, I told you, hey, it's basically area. Here is half of the why it's basically area. We have this proposition 23.1, and it says, if you've got two figures that have equal content, then they have the same area. And a little bit further on in your textbook, let me find the citation, it's proposition 23.7, which we're not going to cover today, but that one actually tells you the other way. It says, hey, if you've got two figures with the same area, you're guaranteed to have equal content. So it's in this section 23 that says, hey, they really are basically the same thing. And then the last thing that we get out of Proposition 23.1 is actually a retelling of Desoult's uh, axiom. So what it says is you've got the same setup as Desoult's axiom from last time, where you've got some figure, maybe P, and you've got some other figure we call Q. And if the complement of Q with respect to P is non-empty. In other words, there's at least one point in your geometry that's in the interior of figure P, but not inside of figure Q. Then this tells you that the area of the bigger figure is larger than the area of that smaller figure Q. That's it. Notice that shouldn't be super surprising, but this is totally a rephrasing of Desoult's axiom. And I can't remember if I told this to you guys last time or not, but that one has the symbol of Z for Desoult's axiom. It was not um, creatively named in any way, shape, or form. Oh, we'll hide that one next. All right, so the next theorem is theorem 23.2, and this one right here is extremely important because it's actually the only one where we have a hard and fast formula for area for a specific type of figure. So it's got a lot of setup and then one really key conclusion that you guys already know. So here's what it says. You start off with some Hilbert plane, you have Playfair's axiom holding, you know you have an area function, and you know that you're going to be able to ha deal with um, our field of line segment arithmetic. And then here's the deal with the area function. It satisfies the following condition that's in italics and is uniquely determined by it as well. So here's the condition. Pick any triangle you want. Pick one of the sides, and we'll arbitrarily pick A, B so we can actually talk about it, to be the base. We'll go ahead and we'll let B be the length of the base, A, B. And we're going to let H be the length of the altitude that's perpendicular to A, B. So if we drew this out, it would look like this. So here's A, here's B, here's C. So from A to B is B, and the altitude right there would be H. Then the conclusion here says the area of that triangle is one half times the base times the height. 
hopefully that is not an earth shattering result. But notice this is where we actually get a tie into an actual formula for the area of something, our case triangles, and it turns out we're not actually going to get a formula for any of the other figures, although there's tons of them out there and people have done them for years, decades, centuries, etc. We're just going to have this formula for triangles. Why do we not need anything else? Because all the other formulas can be built from the area formula for a triangle. Why? Because rectilineal figures can be built from or broken up into just a bunch of non-overlapping triangles. Now, put all that together with the following lemma. So I put a prime at the end of that lemma's number because it's not exactly the same as what your book says. This one's actually the useful version. So what it says is pick any figure you want in your Hilbert plane, doesn't matter which one. Since it's a rectilineal figure, it's going to be able to be broken up into a bunch of different non-overlapping triangles. This is not unique, it's just you cut them up into how many triangles that you care about. Then, and this is the key thing right here, the area of the entire figure is simply the sum of the area of those individual little triangles. That's it. So put these two pieces together, what do you get? You can build the area of any figure you want because you can always, bare minimum, break it down into a bunch of triangles, find those areas and add them up again. Now, not necessarily the most efficient, but that is actually um, just using those two pieces of information, people have built all of the other formulas for area out there. Eh, there's other tricks too. Okay. So that's all the background that we're going to need for area. The only other thing I've got prepped up in terms of this section for area is an example. So here's the example. We're going to assume we're in a Hilbert plane with Playfair's axiom holding. We're going to look at a triangle. It doesn't have to be any special triangle. We're going to call it ABC because we're lazy. And here's what we're going to do with it. We're going to pick a point D, and it's going to be a point that divides our side AB into half. Ooh, we were able to get the whole picture in. Excellent. And we also have some point E that divides BC into thirds. And notice here, thirds, it depends whether that point E is going to be closer to B or closer to the end point C over here. Here, E is going to be closer to B, so B to E is the one-third mark and E to C is the two-thirds mark. Now, suppose we're told that the total area of the triangle ABC is one. What we want to do is we're going to want to find the area of the triangle AGC, so this upper left little triangle right here, where G here is the point of intersection between the two lines AE and CD. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to use a couple of things, but the first thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and put some labels on this picture. So. We'll start off by doing standard notation. So standard notation is, and I'm going to focus here on the triangle ABC, standard notation is to label the length of the side of your triangle, the lowercase letter of the vertex opposite the side. So I'm going to pick on side AC. So if we pick on side AC right here, the vertex in triangle ABC opposite this guy is B, so the length of A to C by standards would be lowercase b. And that's it. Now. If we do the same thing for side AB, well, we could go ahead and write the whole thing as length C, but I don't want to deal with fractions, and we're going to need to deal with the length of AD and the length of BD. But what do we know about the length of AD and the length of BD? What are they supposed to be in relation to each other? Yeah, they're supposed to be equal to each other, either congruent in terms of line segments or have the same length. So if we go ahead and label the length of AD with a C, the length of BD should also be C, since they're supposed to be equal to each other. So there's a trick so you don't have to do um, fractions. Instead of labeling A to B, just a single C, and then dividing it up one half C, one half C, I went ahead and just doubled up and said, hey, C and C. No worries. Now, for down here at the bottom, Notice the length B to E was supposed to be one-third the total length. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same sneaky trick. I'm going to say, hey, this guy is going to be labeled the length of lowercase a, lowercase a because the side BC is opposite the vertex A. So any guesses what the length from C to E should be? Don't overthink it. Remember, E was dividing this guy into thirds. Yep, so that would be 2A. 
Now do a quick check. Is 2A two-thirds of the entire thing? Everybody nod, yep. Is 1A one-third of the entire thing? Yep. If you prefer, you can totally have fractions here. What I did is I took what would normally be fractions of two-thirds A and one-third A, and I just erase the three on the bottom, basically. Now, this gives us the length of all the line segments around the outside, around the sides of the triangle ABC. What it doesn't give us is the length of the line segments A to E, two pieces, or C to D, two pieces. Now, we can actually find all four of these pieces. We're only going to find two of them tonight because we're only going to need two of them to go ahead and find the area of the triangle we care about. But if you wanted to go ahead and find the area of all four of these pieces, you'd actually need to find all four of those lengths. Okay. Now, before we jump into finding these lengths on the inside of the triangle, I want to show you a trick, and this is a trick specifically with area. Well, this whole thing is dealing with area, so that's not too surprising. Now, here's what we know. And go here to the side with what we know. We know that the area of triangle ABC is 1. We also know that AD is congruent to BD. And I do thirds, but thirds doesn't really go well. So maybe we could say something like CE on that last bit of information is the same as 2 times uh, B E. Not technically terribly precise with that two in front of there, but a common convention to indicate a multiple of. Okay. So here's something else we know. We also know that the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So let us look at that triangle A B C. So consider our triangle A B C and let's look at a base. Now, if we want to look at a base of this triangle, a base can be any of the three sides. Now, I'm going to strategically pick one of the sides. I'm not going to tell you why right now, but we'll tell, I'll show you why in just a second. So let's take the base of this guy to be AB. Huh? Now, if we take the base of that guy to be AB, if we want to then find the height of this triangle, and I'll put this on pause for just a second before I keep doing the explanation, if you have some sort of device that you can rotate, such as a phone or a tablet or something of that nature, or a laptop that you can turn sideways, or your head that you can just tip sideways, this would be the time to move your device or tip your head so that the base AB actually is on the bottom. If we were together in person, I would totally take a piece of paper right now that I would have been writing on and turn it sideways. I am now regretting actually not reorienting the picture so it actually was on the bottom, okay? But look at this sideways, rotate it if needed. A, B right here is gonna be our base. And let me see if I can actually highlight this thing. Or not. Doesn't look like it's gonna let me highlight it today. So let's see if I can't highlight it with just a color. So here's our base. Ah, that is a terrible thing to do. All right. That didn't work out at all. Just a second. Here I was thinking I was going to be awesome. And it definitely didn't work. Okay. Now, if we then want to go and find the height of this thing, what happens? You look at the other vertex that's not involved in the base. In our case, that would be vertex C right here. And you draw a line that's perpendicular to base, so perpendicular to AB, and through the point C. So I'm roughly speaking, since this guy's close to a right triangle, pretend that's a straight angle, straight line, that dotted line, which is terribly not straight whatsoever. And then you draw the line that's perpendicular to AB through point C. This guy would be your altitude, and I'm going to call its length H, H for height. Okay. Now, let us get back to actually doing some calculation. If we know, or if we've established that the base of triangle ABC is AB, we can then go ahead and calculate the area of ABC. Don't overthink it. We already know this area is 1. I'm just building to a formula that we're going to need in just a second. So this is 1 half times base 
times height. Now I'll fill in the things we know for sure, which is one half and the height is h. Anybody have a guess on what the base is? Don't overthink it. Yep, it's totally going to be 2c, which means when we go ahead and simplify this thing, the 2 and the 1 half are going to cancel. We'll get h times c. So what we find out is h times c equals 1. And you might be thinking to yourself, not super helpful right now. Don't worry, it will be. So the second thing we're going to do is we want to find another triangle. And here's the key thing with the trick I'm about to show you. The second triangle that you find needs to have its base be on the same line as the base of the first triangle you pick. So our first triangle had a base of AB, so we're going to need to find a triangle that has one of its sides that is contained in or at least lives on the same infinite line as the line segment AB. Well, we have several options. We could look at triangle ACD, triangle DCB, triangle AEB, triangle ABC, not useful, we just use that one. Little triangle AGD, so notice lots of options. So first thing is the bases have to live on the same line. They don't have to be the same line segment, but they have to live on the same infinite line. Second thing is the third vertex, so the vertex that's not incorporated into your base, must be the same. Now, our third vertex for triangle ABC was up here at C, so we need a triangle that has the third vertex to C, and has a base that's on the line AB. That narrows us down to two options. We can look at triangle ACD, or we can look at triangle DCB. Which do you guys think that we want to look at? The upper triangle or the lower triangle? And remember what we're trying to find. We're trying to find the area of AGC here. So what do you think? That upper long skinny triangle or the lower long skinny triangle? In terms of the one we want to focus on. Specifically, we're going to find its area next. What do you think? ACD or DCB? Oh, awesome. Yes. So corrected version, yes. So we're going to want to do the upper triangle right here. Now, why? We want not the, that upper triangle. In fact, that's just to help our triangle step one to get to step two. The actual triangle area that we want to find is AGC. Well, we can't get there yet. We don't have enough information. But if we could find the area of this triangle that contains the triangle we care about, that means we're one step closer. So we're going to grab this triangle ACD. The base of that triangle is AD. So notice base on the same line of the base before, not the same base as before. But they live on the same infinite line, and they share the same third vertex. So if we look at this triangle ACD, we'll have 1 half times base times height. Now quick check. The one half won't change. What's the new base? Or the length of the new base? Okay. So that new base is AD, its length is C, and we picked this guy right here because, and let me highlight it just so we can see it. We're trying to find the area of the triangle that's currently being hatch marked in that what I thought was going to be a perfectly fine green, but actually reminds me of puke a little bit. Sorry about that, guys. So we are trying to find the area of that guy that's hatched in green, so that triangle ACG. So we picked the upper triangle because it included the triangle we cared about, not because we actually care about this triangle ACD. So once we plug into our formula, one half new base, which is C, times the height, and here's the question. What do you think the height of this new triangle is? Anybody have a guess? Ooh, it's not one, but we are going to incorporate one. 
Oh, I've got a couple of guesses. One of them is correct. All right, I don't see any more guesses, so the height is still that H. Why is it still that H? Because we are on the same line as before. Remember, height is the length of the altitude. Altitudes are defined as go through your third vertex and make your line perpendicular to your base. That orange dotted line that's trying to be straight and isn't really because it's hand-drawn, um, is unique. There's only one line that's perpendicular to the infinite line that A, B, and D are all on that also passes through the vertex C. Uh, so the reason that you have to have the shared base or the base in the same infinite line and the same third vertex is you're forcing the heights to be the same. That's the trick here. Now, that being said, we simplify, and really there's nothing to simplification other than dropping the parentheses. But does that mean we can find the area of this triangle? If so, anybody have a guess? You got it. Since C times H is 1, this area is 1 half. And that's actually why we did the first guy when we were looking at the entire triangle ABC. So, put this all together, here's the trick that we actually used. So, if you look at the triangle ACD, it was some ratio times the area of triangle ABC, and that ratio was the base of the bigger triangle, so base AB, and on the top, you had the base of the smaller triangle, so this is base AD. So here, what could we have done? We could have plugged in the base of the littler triangle. That would have been just C. Base of the bigger triangle, which would have been 2C. C and the 2C would cancel. And what we would have here is a ratio that says that this upper triangle is one half the area of the bigger triangle. And then the area of the bigger triangle wouldn't necessarily have to be an area of one. It could actually be whatever area you want to throw in there, maybe 158 divided by two, and that's the area of the upper triangle. Same logic works for that lower triangle that we didn't touch. Now, here's the fun part. We don't care about this triangle ACD. We care about the shaded triangle ACG. So using this same logic, we can actually build a formula for this triangle ACG. It would be some ratio times the triangle ACD. Notice that second guy right here, the second triangle, is not the full entire triangle ABC. It is only the triangle that was half the larger triangle. Huh? So we're going to cut it down further and we're going to do ratio. So if we look at these two triangles, shaded one and the one we just found, they're going to share a base right here along CD. Because you can pick one of the sides that they share and then they have to share a third point. So CG, CD would be the two bases. And the height would be A to wherever that perpendicular line actually fell down there between G and D. I don't know, maybe somewhere, not a right triangle, so maybe somewhere roughly-ish there. Okay. So oriented this way, where now this actually looks properly horizontal, you'll have, get your same height, and then all you have to do out front is base over base, smaller one over bigger one. So here, you would have on the top, the smaller base would be the CG. Did not mean for that to be orange, but we'll go with it, and CD on the bottom. And that's it. No, that's not really it. Because what's the thing missing? We don't know what those two guys in orange are. So the next thing we're going to do is actually figure out what is the length of these two line segments. This is where we're going to go ahead and apply Menelaus' theorem, and this is actually why we talked about Menelaus' theorem back when we picked up the stuff from similar triangles, because we needed it here with area. So, apply Menelaus' theorem to, and you always have to apply it to a triangle and a line. That was trying to be the same. 
scripty L for a line. Okay. Now, for Menelaus' theorem to work, you pick a triangle, any triangle you want, and you pick a line that intersects two of the sides of the triangle. The line cannot go through any of the vertices of the triangle. So notice, we actually do have more than one triangle that has a line that crosses two of its sides, but we also have a bunch of triangles where the line goes through its verse, vertex, or a vertex. You don't want those second options. Does anybody spot a triangle that has a line cutting through or intersecting two of the sides? Anybody spot a triangle that would work? Or a triangle that has a line that's cutting through the two, two of its sides? Let's see, A, E, B, A, E, yup, that would totally be one that would work. A, E, B right here, and then the line C to G to D, and that would totally work. Um, it would actually give us the length of A to G and G to E. So we're not going to use that one for right now because it would give us the length of the two sides that we don't need right now, but totally would work for Menelaus' theorem, and if we went and had to find the area of all four pieces, which we're not going to do tonight, that we would need to do that. Okay? So let's find the other one. Anybody spot the other triangle in this situation? that would work with Menelaus' theorem. So it would have to be a different triangle where CD. Yep, that would be the other one. So the other one would be this one right here, which is CDB, and the line would be A to E. And this one will actually get us the length of C to G and D to, D to G. Here's the trick, because it has taken me a while to figure out which one works. I would go, I'd see this one, I'd go for it and be like, huh, that came out to be the wrong line segment. It happens, you just go to the other triangle. But the way to know if it's going to work or not, you, if you need these two line segments lengths, so D to G and G to C, that has to be one of the sides of the triangle you're going to pick. That's actually the, the hint on how to pick the triangle. So for us, we're going to go ahead and use this triangle C, D, B. And then the line would be A. And just so we can see the triangle while we're writing out the formula, I'm going to make that tiny for a sec. So remember, Menelaus' theorem, it had three fractions multiplied together, all equaling one. What we're going to do is each of those fractions will correspond to one of the sides of our triangle. And then uh, we'll put the endpoints, the name of the side, one on the top, one on the bottom. So let's do that first. So what's the side that you guys like of CDB? It doesn't matter which one, you just got to pick one. Anybody got a favorite side? I'm going to try to highlight the edges while you guys are coming up with a favorite side. I see no favorite side, so I'm going to pick BC. So, suppose you pick side BC. Then what do you do? You look for the intersection of the side BC and your line. So BC, AE will intersect to E. So we'll fill in E. And the, key, and the key here is you do have to go ahead and build two proper line segments. Next thing you do is you take whatever endpoint of the side that was on the bottom, and put it on the next top. So we'll put C on the top. Then you say, all right, well, what's a side that has C as one of its endpoints and it's not BC? Well, it's the, next, it's the one next to it. So it's C to D. And then you look where C, D, that side, intersects your line AE. You say, oh, well, that's G right there. So you'll fill in G and build two new little line segments. And lastly, you'll take your endpoint D, put it on the new top, and the only side left is D to B. And that's good news because the B on the bottom matches with the first endpoint we had at the beginning and that you always need. Okay. We'll then fill in, and this is where DB, side DB, and the line AE intersect. Make no mistake, they don't really, so you have to extend BD, and you extend it, and they will then eventually intersect at point A. And that's Menelaus' theorem. That's all Menelaus' theorem tells you. Everything else is where we're going to go and use line segment arithmetic. So some of these line segments, we already know what their lengths are, and some of them we don't. So we'll only fill in what we know. So BE. BE, we said earlier, had a length of A. C, 
CE. CE, we said earlier, had a length of 2A. Now, this next one was trying to be a CG. CG is somebody we don't know, but we want to. DG, same deal. Don't know those lengths, but we want to. So I see your question, and that's why I paused. Uh, no. So it's always going to be the two endpoints here, the D and the B. You ignore where the intersection actually is, and then the second letter will always be the intersection point. And this last fraction really is the one that's weird, and we're actually really we're set up to get it. So D, A, D to A is just C, no worries. But this other one, when you've extended your line segment to get the intersection, one of them will just be bet between the intersection point and the endpoint, but the other one is going to cross, and so it's going to look like you've got some overlap there. No, I've done that way too many times. Okay, so this one here is the one where you want to be very, very careful. It's one of the reasons I walk you guys through the formula like I do, not because of random other reasons, but because of that fraction issue that you pointed out. So here, when we go now B to A, it's the C plus the C, so here it's 2C. And that last fraction is by far the hardest one to get accurate. If you get into the swing of things where you've got the format of how you build Menelaus' theorem, and you're careful about your number, your letters from your picture, it's no big deal. But if you're not careful, it's super easy to just say C over C on that last one, so be careful. Everybody's done that at least once to, to 10 times. All right, so the next thing is we're trying to figure out what the length of CG is and DG. So notice things are going to cancel. OK, so that's the same question. And it's totally because of Menelaus' theorem, which I don't have prepped up here. But if you look at what Menelaus' theorem says, it says this bit. So you've got your line segments that are your sides right here. So you have to have those bits on every single one of your fractions. Then the other part of your fraction is the intersection points. So first fraction, the intersection of your line and the side BC is at E. So both of them are going to be E's. The next one is line segment or side CD. The intersection there and the line AE is G. And last one is it's still the side DB, so you have to have the D and the B. And here is where the intersection is. Here, though, the intersection is not between the endpoints of the sides. It's further on down. So when you start building it out, it looks stupid and funky. But it's not the same format as the other two cases, but it's still the front right format for Menelaus' theorem. If you don't have it here, your, your ratios are actually going to be off. All right, now once you're at this stage, what we're going to do is we're going to solve for CG and DG. Now notice what's always going to happen. Your A's are going to cancel. Your C's are going to cancel. Turns out all those little letters are going to cancel. Your, you'll get a one-half. You'll get a one-half. So first step is this would totally look like one-fourth CG over DG equals one. We don't care about that format. So instead, we're going to rewrite it. I'm going to multiply both sides by 4 times dg. So this tells us that cg equals 4 times dg. And technically speaking there, we should have all the we should have gone ahead and put the correct symbols, but I wasn't bothering because we were doing the line segment arithmetic. And because my hand was shaking a little bit, I didn't want to mess up the letters. All right. Now, what does this tell us? Now, I have prepped up this picture for us. So let us blow this up a little bit and we'll look at the picture. So here's what this tells us. We first of all need to go ahead and let DG have a length and I'm going to call it length G. G because the intersection point that we're looking at is point G. So if we know that DG has a length of G, 
G, then CG has to have a length of what? Anybody have a guess? Hopefully you were all thinking, well, I have this formula over here. If DG is G, CG has to be 4G. And in that case, yes. Okay. Now, the total line segment and its personal preference, whether you want to write this down or not, often people won't bother. The total line segment from C to D would be what will be the sum of those two pieces, so that would be 5G. And this is where we put it all together. Now, previously, we said that the area of our triangle ACG was going to be some ratio times the area of our triangle ACD. I think we said ADC before. I don't remember. The t that upper half one. Okay? And that ratio was on the top fraction, CG, and on the bottom fraction, CD. So that's what we had previously. We're now at the point where we plug in. Well, we still have this fraction we need to worry about. But we know from previously that the area of that upper half triangle was simply going to be one half. So when we put this all together, we then pull the things we just found. So C to G we found was 4G, and C to D we found was 5G. Notice again, the Gs totally cancel. That is not coincidence, they always will. And we'll get 4 fifths times 1 half, which is totally the same as 2 over 5. So this tells us the area of that shaded region is 2 over 5. Now, this question didn't ask us to do this, but you could totally go and find the area of the other pieces and parts too. So for example, if you wanted the area of say triangle A, D, G, this other upper little teeny tiny triangle, the smallest triangle in the picture, this one would simply be 1 half minus 2 fifths. Why? Because it's that upper half minus the big piece you don't want. You could do a similar analysis, which I'm not going to go through right now, and find that lower piece of triangle C, G, and E. Turns out this guy is one-third, but in order to get that, you would have to go ahead and find the length of A to G and E to G by using Menelaus' theorem again. And you could also find the area of the non-triangular piece, so B, D, G, E. This one would be total area minus all the other things you found. So minus the two-fifths, minus the one-fourth, minus the one-third. And it actually turns out that this guy would be one-sixth if you simplify that. Uh, so there's a lot of different things you could do, but notice these other ones, told, well, this one's the same as what we just did, but these other two start dealing with, okay, well, I add the pieces and the area of the pieces and parts together to get the total. And that's it in terms of area, or at least that we're going to cover. Questions kind of make sense, a little bit okay so far. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so I will go ahead and talk about dissections next. So with dissections, the first thing is, what is a dissection? It turns out a dissection is almost exactly the same as saying two uh, figures are equidecomposable. Remember, equidecomposable meant you could cut up one figure in a bunch of triangles, reassemble the triangles, and get the second newer figure. Here's the difference. With dissections, you still have two figures. One of the figures is cut up into a bunch of pieces, but now they don't have to be triangles. If you actually have a dissection, you reassemble all of those little pieces and get your second figure. The only difference between two figures that are equidecomposable and is does a dissection exist is equidecomposable says the pieces have to be triangles dissection says the pieces don't have to be triangles so what we just did here if we had a second figure somewhere else these four pieces the first three that are triangles totally cool for an act somebody two figures that might be equidecomposable but this fourth one that's not a triangle says, hey, we're not going to be talking about equidecomposable most likely with these pieces it looks like we'd be talking about dissections, again, if there was a second figure. So that's really the only difference. 
Now, a couple of things to note, if two figures are equidecomposable and you already have the breakdown of the triangles, that is a dissection. So equidecomposable is a specific type of dissection where all the pieces are triangles. Now, interesting fact, if you have a dissection and it's not necessarily all triangles, all of the figures that are not triangles, you can actually cut them up into triangles. Why? Because any rectilineal figure is a union of triangles, non-overlapping triangles. And then you can force your dissection into uh, dealing with equidecomposable. Interesting fact there. If you do have two figures where one of these dissections exists, they're called equivalent by way of dissection, and it turns out their area is the same. And that's what we're going to get at the end of this slide. In terms of what you could see, there are three main cases. One is you're given the two figures and you're already told what the dissection should be. You just have to verify it works. Second one is you're given two figures, but you have to figure out what the dissection is. And the third one, which is what we're going to talk about today because it's the most complicated, is you're given one of the figures and you're not given the second figure. You have to figure out what it's going to be equivalent to and how to dissect it into that other figure. Okay. Now, if you're dealing with the first two cases where you already have the two figures, and this is very similar to what you have in homework. Why? Because it's easier. Okay. Um, a best practice is to go ahead and check to see if theorem 24.7 applies. Now, here's the thing about theorem 27, 24.7, is it'll tell you if a dissection exists. It'll flat out say, yes, a dissection exists. No, it doesn't but it won't tell you what the dissection is. So here's what this guy says. It says, hey, check their area. If the area of the two figures are exactly the same, that means your two figures are equivalent by dissection. In other words, one can be cut up into the other guy. Use triangles, use don't, don't use triangles, nobody cares. Just cut them up into pieces, rearrange them, you'll get the other guy. Turns out, if you know a dissection already exists, it also tells you that their area has to work, but if you're searching for the dissection, and you are able to calculate the area first, this is a quick way to check to see if a dissection exists. For example, if the areas of the two figures are different, there's no way a dissection would exist, and that would save you some work. Now, if a dissection exists, you could be asked to do something that's called a proof by dissection, and all that shows is that the two figures are equivalent by dissection. In other words, it's a way to verify the dissection works. It's got three components. The first one is simply some scratch work. It's not something that I ever need to see from you. However, it's probably the most important step in order to get this thing to work. Okay. The first thing you do is you sketch your figures, you sketch what you think the dissection will be, how to cut the pieces up, where to cut them, label any pieces if you want to label them, and figure out how the pieces fit from one figure to the other. Okay. This is where you're doing all the work. Now, second step you do is you actually do a very formal Hilbert construction. I would highly recommend that the actual picture is straight edge and compass, otherwise major issues can ensue, but it's technically a Hilbert construction. Okay. This is where you verify all the pieces and parts. This is how you establish how you actually what you need to get. And then the last part is the proof. Specifically, the proof is you're going to be showing that the individual corresponding pieces and parts of your two figures really are congruent. So this is, these two guys in conjunction with each other are totally showing that the dissection really does work. Um, and I mention that really because if you've ever seen things that are like um, figure puzzles or geometry puzzles or mind teaser puzzles that are picture oriented, a lot of them are actually based, not all, but many of them are actually based on dissections where you cut up some figure, you rearrange it, it looks like everything went beautifully and the first figure start off with, I'm thinking of one that starts off with like a square and then they cut it up and they move the pieces around and all of a sudden it's a new square that's the same size except there's a hole in the middle. Well, that's not really happening. There was some sort of illusion going on because what do we have? If you've got a dissection working, you're going to have the same area in both places across both figures. Okay? So this is where you make sure that there's no optical illusions going on in terms of your diagrams. All right. So let us look at a relatively straightforward case. 
So for this guy, I just pulled it from Proposition 24.1, where in our normal setup, Hilbert plane with the parallel axiom, or Playfair's axiom holding, and you've got a triangle. So here's the scratch work. Okay? So you say, hey, I've got a triangle. So maybe this is triangle A, B, C. Pretend that's really a triangle. Now, what do you need? You want to dissect this into a parallelogram. So you got to figure out what parallelogram is going to happen. Could you draw a parallelogram to the side? Sure. But the best practice is to try to have the two figures on top of each other because it's less work. So maybe we say this base is also the base of the parallelogram. Maybe we say the parallelogram actually goes up somehow on side AB. And then what do we know about parallelograms? We know that the opposite sides are parallel. So these guys are supposed to be parallel to each other. Okay. Let me go ahead and label the key points. Maybe this is F. Maybe this is ah. Not want that to erase. Maybe this is D. Maybe this is E. Okay. Now, in order to go ahead and find this parallelogram, notice if you have the triangle, you have the same base. So you got to figure out how far up these guys are going to go. In other words, you've got to figure out where AE is going to live. So what's some things that you definitely need to know? We need to know how to find this line EF, which means we've got to figure out how to find point E or D or F. So we'll come back to that one. Okay. Notice what else we have, and I'm going to write this below the picture. Our triangle ABC is totally the same as triangle ADE and that pentagon BCDE. And then the parallelogram is BCFE, and this guy is the triangle uh, CDF and that same pentagon. Now, if this is the right pentagon that triangle ABC is dissected into, what we're going to need is we're going to need those two pieces to be congruent to each other. Well, the second one, pentagon totally congruent to each other because they're the same figure. No worries there. So the only thing we're going to really have to need is we're going to have to figure out why triangle ADE or how triangle ADE is congruent to triangle DEF. Now, there are some things that are immediate. Anybody have a guess of what some of the immediate things are? Hint, they refer to angles. Well, in order for these guys to be congruent, you have to have what? You have to have all angles and all sides are congruent, but we have a bunch of triangle congruent theorems, so you either have to have all three sides congruent or two of the sides and one of the angles or two of the angles and one of the sides congruent. Don't do all three angles because then it's similar and not congruent. So here, I'm going to claim that there are some angles that are easily congruent. I'm going to do the really easy one first. Two angles at D are actually congruent. Anybody have a guess why? And while you're typing, I'll put in the second set of angles. So that first set of angles is congruent by... Hopefully you were all thinking blank angles. It starts with a B. Does that help? Maybe not. Hopefully you're all thinking internally vertical angles. Yay, somebody was thinking it. So these guys, true by vertical angles, just the two lines crossing each other, you're guaranteed that those guys are going to be congruent. Now, my claim is the angle marked here A and marked here at C are also congruent. Anybody have a guess why those two angles are congruent to each other? Hint, it is because CF is parallel to AB. Does that help? They're not going to be vertical. 
the three letter three word name. Hopefully you're all thinking alternate interior angles is why those will be there. And as long as we've actually created the parallel lines at CF and EF to get the parallelogram, that'll be automatic too. So this is mostly automatic, but we only have two angles. Could we find the third? Yeah, the third will be there fine, but we need congruent, not similar. So we need to go ahead and make sure they're congruent. So we need at least one side. Turns out you can do a bunch of different things, but the most efficient is going to be saying that side AD and side DC are congruent. Now, what would that give you? That would then say that we can use angle side angle as our triangle congruence theorem. And then if we had this right there, we would automatically get that those two triangles are congruent and bam, the dissection would work. Okay. So this, this is the scratch working diagram. It gives you a plan. Notice what it also gives you. This also gives you an idea on how to find your line EF. That line EF right there. needs to come from either point E or point D or point F to get its distance away from the line BC. So let's go by point D. Point D here needs to be the midpoint of AC. So let's put it all together. So the next slide is going to be the two steps where we deal with the actual Hilbert construction, and then we're going to prove that this these two triangles are congruent to each other. All right, so I'm actually going to put both steps on one slide. So for this guy right here, we've got formal construction. We've got the triangle that's given. Then we're going to go ahead and get our midpoint D. We're going to go ahead and draw a line that's parallel to BC through that point D. Extend it as far as you want to. We'll go ahead and we'll form a line that's parallel to AB through the point C. And even though I went ahead and put in point F right here, technically speaking, um, you could just say, all right, point F comes from the intersection of those two parallel lines. Notice at this point right here, and I totally forgot to actually write it in, but at this point, because we've drawn in these two lines or constructed these two new lines by being parallel, the existing sides automatically B, C, F, E is a parallelogram. And that would just be because of the definition. And I forgot to write that one in, so that's not going to come in when we fly in the next stuff. Now, once we've done the construction, at this point, that's it for the Hilbert construction. Okay? The rest of it, we're now going to jump into the proof part. The proof part, honestly, you keep the Hilbert construction stuff, and often I'll just put these two guys together. So technically speaking, we needed that missing piece that says we now have a parallelogram. So I'm going to claim that our two guys, two angles at D, are congruent. 15 here is vertical line, vertical angles, excuse me, same as what we've said previously. We're also going to say that the angle at A is congruent. The angle at C, the two marked ones, that's not vertical angle, that's a typo that I missed. That one's alternate interior angles, and I'll put that in once we finish the slide. And I'll put it in now. Alternate interior angles. The next thing is we've got that AD and CD are congruent. That's just how we did our um, D as a midpoint, so our construction. And then that tells us that our triangle Two triangles are congruent by angle, side, angle, which is exactly what we said before. So let me put back in the markings. So those are the same exact markings that we had before. And the typo, this one here, 15 is vertical angles, and this one's supposed to be alternate interior angles. And that's it. That's the entirety of a dissection. 
Now, to be fair, that particular picture, that particular dissection was relatively, relatively straightforward in that there was only two pieces that you had to worry about being congruent to each other. If you had a third piece somewhere, you have to worry about that next pair being congruent to each other as well. well let me end on showing you a picture relation of something interesting, and then that'll be it for tonight. Okay? But that, that's it in terms of your dissection. The last thing is this lemma. It talks about when you can notice an obtuse angle. Okay? So again, we're Hilbert plane, play for axiom. You got some triangle ABC. And suppose you've got an altitude, and this altitude actually lands so that it is outside of your base. Okay? So what happens, you extended your base, and this point D is now in that extension. Turns out if that happens, then either your angle B or your angle C is going to be an obtuse angle. Okay? So it turns out you can figure out which one. Angle B is the obtuse angle. If B is the one in the middle. Angle C is the obtuse angle. If C is the one in the middle. Now please note this does not, well, you can only have at most one obtuse angle in your triangle. So if you have this situation, you're guaranteed to have the obtuse angle at either B or C. If point D here from your altitude is on point B, so B and D are the same point, or C and D are the same point, you actually have a right angle at point B or point C. If D is between, properly between points B and C, you can have whatever. I typically think of it in terms of an acute angle, but that angle at A could also be obtuse and it also could be right as well. So you don't know anything at this point D is between these two angles other than the angles of B and C themselves have to be acute, but you know nothing about the angle A. But that's an interesting little tidbit, not really a dissection, but it turns out it's actually a result of some of the previous stuff with dissection. Okay. But that is everything for tonight. Unless you guys have extra questions, that's it for tonight.